Mechanical refrigeration is one of the many things that we take for granted in our everyday lives. Chances are, you don't even think before throwing your groceries in the fridge and shutting the door behind them, being fully confident that they'll be kept fresh for days or even weeks afterwards. Thanks to refrigeration, we have access to fresh food on demand. We can store leftovers, make frozen desserts, and procrastinate throwing out that thing that you push to the back that's definitely been in there for too long and is starting to get gross. But what did people do before all of that? The modern refrigerator has really only been around since the 1900s, but historical records show us that people have had access to things like ice cream for literally hundreds of years. So how did our ancestors do it? Ladies and gentlemen, this is Historidame, and today, I seek to answer the question, how did we keep things cold before refrigeration? We might not have had refrigeration for most of our history, but we did have human creativity, and ancient problem solvers were able to find quite a few interesting ways to preserve food. The shelf life of ingredients was often prolonged through methods like drying, canning, smoking, or salting. But there were also quite a few natural ways to keep perishable items cold. Some people buried their food by sticking it in a hole or building a cellar, which kept items shielded from sunlight, heat, or air, all of which could cause food to spoil faster. Other groups found a way to use bodies of water for their natural preservation properties. They discovered that places which are cool, acidic, and low in oxygen, like peat bogs and wetlands, could stave off bacteria and help keep food fresh for longer. We have evidence that such places were used for food storage by certain Native American tribes and some people in Northern Europe. Bodies of water have also been used in food preservation by farmers for many years. Dairy farmers, for example, would build spring houses, which were small stone buildings constructed around a natural underground spring. These springs would stay cold all year round, which made them the perfect place to store tins of milk, cream, and butter. But when it comes to ancient forms of refrigeration, the king among them is definitely the ice house. This was basically a non-mechanical fridge. Though their methods of construction could vary depending on who was making them, the basic idea was this. First, a pit would be dug into the ground, which was then insulated with materials like straw, branches, or sawdust. This would usually be located close to a source of fresh water, so that the natural ice it produced in the winter could be used. Then, a dome-like structure would be built over top of the pit. In the winter, ice and snow would be collected from the nearby body of water and then stored inside the ice house. The building's shape, underground temperature, and insulation would then work in tandem to keep it cold all the way through the summer, where the ice would then be used for things like preserving food, chilling drinks, and making frozen desserts. Now, I've always thought of things like cold drinks and ice cream to be a relatively modern idea, but these go back way farther than you might think. Ice houses have existed in some form or another for literally thousands of years. In fact, the oldest known record that we have is from a cuneiform tablet that dates all the way back to 1780 BC in northern Mesopotamia. So while the SpongeBob popsicle might be a modern invention, ice cream certainly wasn't. By the beginning of the 1800s, ice houses had spread all across the developed world, bringing their many uses with them. But as nice as it was to have access to ice year-round, the amount of work that it took to build and maintain these structures made them a very expensive endeavor, something that only the wealthy could afford. Ice houses were also restricted to areas with cold winters, or mountains that snow and ice could be harvested from. All of that was about to change, however, when one man had a brilliant idea. Frederick Tudor was a businessman and merchant from Boston, who after a trip to the Caribbean, became convinced that if he could figure out some way to get ice there, he could make a fortune selling it. Everyone, of course, thought this was a little bit ridiculous. Surely the ice would melt over such a long journey. But Tudor was determined, so in 1806 he bought a boat, packed it full of ice from his father's farm, and set out on his first voyage to Martinique. Surprisingly, some of the ice would actually make it to the Caribbean intact, but most melted during the voyage, and then the rest of it melted almost immediately upon arriving, since Tudor had nowhere to store it. But he didn't care that his first attempt resulted in a financial loss. Some of the ice had still made it there, 
and that was enough of a success for Frederick Tudor. He would continue his attempts to ship ice to the Caribbean, founding the Tudor Ice Company and building ice houses in every port that he landed in. Tudor also experimented with different forms of insulation to keep his ice frozen for longer, until eventually he had created a thriving industry. By the mid-1800s, the idea of shipping ice to hot climates was no longer something to laugh at. It was serious business, and not just for Frederick Tudor, but for many copycat businessmen as well. Soon ice harvesting was a legitimate career choice, but one that involves a lot of hard work. Ice taken from lakes needed to be at least 18 inches thick in order to bear the weight of the harvesting crew and their equipment. First the snow would need to be scraped off the top, before the ice would be tested for suitability. Then a grid would be drawn over the surface of the lake, sorting the ice into neat uniform blocks, before it would be broken off with ice spades and floated over to the shore. There, more workers would cut it to size, before it was shipped off to the ice houses for storage. The expansion of the ice trade would eventually cause the resource to be available to the average person. No longer would it be monopolized by rich lords who could afford to build their own ice house. Now it was a consumer good, that anyone could access. And with ice available to everyone, our lives were about to change forever. With the price of ice drastically reduced thanks to the ice trade, by the 1830s it was a common consumer good. People began to store it in their homes, using a precursor to the mechanical refrigerator, known as the icebox. Iceboxes essentially worked the same as a modern-day cooler. They were commonly made of wood and had double walls with a space in between that was lined with zinc or tin, and then filled with an insulating material. Food would be stored inside like we do with a regular fridge, and a separate compartment would house a block of ice that would help to circulate cold air around the rest of the device. In order to have a regular supply of fresh ice, people would restock with the assistance of the Iceman. Households would send in their order, requesting how many pounds of ice they needed, and then the Iceman would come to their door in a wagon and make his daily rounds delivering ice. Deliveries would be kept track of using a sign and card system, where households would flip a sign to indicate whether or not they required a delivery for that day. The Iceman would then break off the requested amount of ice from his larger blocks, and use tongs to transfer it to the delivery box. The position of Iceman was just as important as something like a mailman, but this was not an easy job. Those in the trade could start their days as early as 4am, and work well into the evening, often having to do it on weekends and holidays as well. But thanks to all of this hard work and the invention of the icebox, middle-class families had regular access to fresh food, and this would completely change the public's eating habits. Those living in cities now had the opportunity to enjoy fresh meat, dairy, and produce year-round, something which was previously reserved for the rich or those living in rural communities. But something new was on the horizon that was about to shake things up even more, and by the 1900s, the ice industry's days were numbered. Who exactly invented the electric refrigerator cannot really be attributed to one person. It was more of a collaborative effort, where different pieces of the puzzle were contributed by inventors over a span of about 200 years. The first electric refrigerator that was commercially successful, however, was invented by General Electric in 1927, and this is when things really started to take off. While there had been some attempts to break into the home refrigerator market in the past, GE's Monitor Top model was the first of its kind to be efficient and affordable enough to be accepted by the general public. The 20s and 30s also saw the use of Freon as a refrigerant, which was a non-toxic alternative to past choices like ammonia or propane. These new and sleek refrigerator designs suddenly became a must-have appliance for any middle-class household, and the public was loving it. No longer did they have to wait for regular deliveries from the Iceman. Now, all of their fresh food could be kept cold and stay that way indefinitely. As did the icebox before it, the electric refrigerator would again change our relationship with food. While before, people would be getting access to fresh produce on demand for pretty much the first time ever, now the wonders of mechanical refrigeration gave birth to all kinds of new foods that used this technology. 
cold drinks, frozen desserts, and all kinds of chilled dishes, including those gelatin abominations that were so loved at the time, would now be making the rounds in middle-class households all across America. The refrigerator was the future of food, wrapping us all in its icy embrace for years to come. And though this wonderful appliance is here to stay, sometimes it can be fun to look back on our history and see just how innovative our ancestors were. Hey everyone, thank you for watching! If you enjoyed the video, please consider leaving a like or a comment down below. If you want to see more content like this, you can also subscribe to my channel and keep up to date on all the fun history videos of the future. But for now, I bid you farewell.